Hey everybody, it's Wednesday the 9th. I thought it was the 7th, but I looked it up and no, it's indeed the 9th of June today. It is almost summer for real. So thanks for tuning in from wherever you are. If you haven't been to Change the Shed before, welcome to my studio in Fort Collins, Colorado, USA. And I'm happy that you all are here. I'm working on hand basket again today. Um, it's not done yet and it's okay. It's uh, been fun. So y'all are checking in from all over. Thanks for um, coming by from Pittsburgh and Texas and New York and uh, te another Texas and Vermont. And Jessica wants to know about paint color for her studio. I think white is generally the choice there, Jessica. I would go with white. Um, Quebec, welcome. And Kansas City. New York, Texas, where it's probably really hot. It's hot here. It's going to be way into the 90s uh, today and tomorrow, which is a lot for northern Colorado. We're at 5,000 feet and we like to stay a little bit cooler, but whew, it's hot. Littleton, hey, right down the road. Hi, Cindy. Um, yeah. So uh, UK, hi, Paula. Indianapolis, Boston, uh, muggy Maryland. So usually in Colorado, we don't have humidity, but it has also been humid here because we got so much rain this spring. So it is hot and humid and um, not fond of it. So fortunately, my studio is in the basement. We don't have air conditioning, so as many people in Colorado don't. So um, the basement is the place to be, which means maybe I get some weaving done. Um, San Juans. I love the San Juan Islands, Ruth. Welcome. Um, yeah, I once taught a class in Friday Harbor and it was so much fun that um, I definitely want to go back to the San Juan Islands. Very cool place, uh, Washington and of course, Canada. Just south of Victoria. I am screwing this up again. So this is what I'm working on today is the hand basket piece. You can see that I added, here, let me switch these like this. I added the um, colors here in the basket and I like how it turned out. I don't know if you remember I was um, talking about several weeks ago whether I was going to, um, that I wanted to make the farther away parts of the basket darker and so I like how that turned out. And uh, anyway, that was fun. And I am going to put a butterfly in here on the left. And today I'm going to try to fill in this corner a little bit and um, we'll see how much time we have. Um, I will definitely be at the butterfly soon, so that will be fun. Yes, this is the Shacked Aross uh, Tapestry Loom. And it has um, been a lot of fun to work on. So... Um, okay. Anyway, glad you're all here and let me know if anything goes awry. I really feel like, I always feel like the light isn't bright enough on this tapestry. Um, let's see if I can make it better. If I move a light right behind me, yeah. Not great, not great. Sorry, y'all. I don't know, it's the same every week. I don't know why some weeks I feel like I cannot see it. Maybe it's my monitor. <laughs> Hold on. Oh yeah, that's better. See, y'all should have said, looks fine here. Um, brightness on my monitor and I knocked the camera, didn't I? 
Pardon my mumbling. Really sorry, y'all. Okay. Let's look at that for the moment. Rebecca in real time. I've gotten this bad habit of, um, some people weave like this all the time, of using my fingers like this to beat it in. And um, it's actually not good for your fingers to do that. You can cause over, if you did it for 20 years, you'd cause some, I think you'd cause some issues in your fingertips. So let's try to use a tool. Jessica is asking, how do I decide whether to use a bobbin or a butterfly? Uh, whims of whims of time, Jessica. Um, if the ends aren't too long, I just like this doesn't have, these are fairly short pieces. I don't bother putting them into a butterfly. I don't use bobbins a lot. I use them on small pieces where I have hand spun because I want to protect it. That's on very small looms. And I just didn't learn using bobbins, so it's not my method of choice, but they work great. Some people use them 100% of the time, so there's no right or wrong answer there. Okay, I'm making a little curve. Let's go like that. You don't see that? No. Yeah, that's better. Yes, Cheryl, the um this part is at eighties PI and the letters this part is at sixteen. That is correct. Okay, and um, yeah, that's a good question, um, Michelle. She's noticing I put a yellow eccentric outline here and here, and I realized that I did not actually, I did it down here in the orange, but I didn't do it. No, I did do it in the red, but I didn't put the yellow across. I actually kind of like how that looks, so there's some possibility that I might actually, oh, you can't see this down here, hold on. Down here, um, I didn't outline this one in yellow, and so I kind of like how it looks because it's flames, and I want it to look like it's in front of the background. I don't know, I'll look at it when it's done, but it's possible I might actually add that silk outline around. There's two below here that don't have the silk outline in yellow, so I actually like it. Um, but I was not consistent when I put it together. All right, so I wanna check my sheds. The shedding, I have two shedding mechanisms on this and they're not, um, the upper one is for ADPI and it's not actually working really great. So just cause the other shedding mechanism is in the way. So I'm picking the eight ends print a lot, but I think that shed is correct now. The yellow does bring it forward, yeah, but, um, yeah, I don't know, Michelle, it's a good question. I didn't realize until you said that that I had done that, and it, I'll have to look when I take it off how many times I switched it. I clearly was not consistent, so it'll be interesting. Some of it, could, if I wanted to add it, I could do that. I don't think I could easily take out um, that yellow, so I don't know. 
we'll see. All right, I'm gonna add another orange. Oh, I think I had, I think I left the tails long enough, I did. Here's one of the reasons I like to weave from the front is that, I mean, from the back is that I can find my tails. Eccentric outlining. Y'all are trying to train me not to say eccentric. If you don't know me or haven't taken my classes, you know I have this. We're just going to call it an eccentric habit. <laughs> um, sorry, that's not even funny. Um, an eccentric habit of, oh, that's in the wrong shed. I was an occupational therapist for 17 years and in OT school for whatever reason, the school I went to taught us eccentric contractions. We would say it eccentric just to emphasize versus whatever the other term is, which I can't even remember now. Um, so, yeah, I uh, still say that, and it is, um, in tapestry weaving, it should be eccentric. Eccentric. Um, Anyway, whatever. That's what I mean. Over. Okay. Sorry, I was having a little trouble getting my sheds right while I was trying to talk. Sorry about my arm is also in the way. I don't know if I can. This loom also desperately, the shed would work better it, it's way beyond where I need to move the um, tapestry down. I just left it up so that you all could see it. But as soon as I'm done today, I'm going to move the whole thing down so that it's easier to work on. The one advantage of this loom is that it does raise and lower. So I can move it all the way down and then raise the loom up a little bit so that it's at um, a nice height. All right, I need red. Oh, I feel like I did the same thing with the red here. Yep. I left the pairs because I outlined the red here and I left the tails over here so I could just do a short jump instead of creating even more tails. So I want this in the same shed. This is a um, split weft outline, which I talk about in Warp and Weft. I thought I was so on things today, y'all. I feel good today. I got good sleep. The flowers are beautiful, but I... I feel like I'm now fumbling around a lot. I know you'll forgive me, because you always do. All right, oh, I did the same thing. Um, all right, we're gonna do it like that. The astute among you will see that I just Fudge that a little bit. It's okay, because it's not gonna show. Now this time I actually left the red on the surface here, and I think this is gonna be in the wrong shed. Um, yes, so I need... My effort to curtail tails, I'm gonna cause more tails. Um, 
going to fix this shedding problem with one piece of the wool. Also could have done one more pick with the red silk. Okay, now we're ready to fill that in. So now we go back to, that's the only part that's done eccentrically or eccentrically, where it is not perpendicular, and now we're doing, we're back to weaving um, perpendicular to the warp. McKenna asked if the um, a Rosslyn can be set up for, for salvage. Um, I have not tried it. It does have very good tensioning, so it is quite possible there is a way to do it. However, um, yeah, I can't think of an elegant way to do it right now. Even on the Mirex, it's a little bit clunky because the bottom beams are so wide, and on this loom, the beams are even wider which is great if you're using it warped like it's intended to be warped, but might be a little, there might be a different way you'd need to do it as a for salvage in the fringeless way that I teach with Sarah Sweat in the fringeless course. I've been weaving samples on Merrick's treadle, uh, Merrick's looms for my design solutions class. The second season of which is now up, all of it, except for one thing I'm not done with. And um, I got, I, I'm used to the treadle because it's so fast, bang, bang, bang. So little sections like this. Um, I get frustrated by picking the shed. And it's harder because the um, this warp has gotten too short. If you saw one of my last blog posts, it was about making your warp longer. As soon as I roll this down, it will be a lot easier to weave because the warp will be tight but more flexible. It'll be easier to pick it. Here I am like shoving it in with my fingers again because I if I was using a bobbin, the tool would be in my hand and it would be fast. So that would be an advantage of a bobbin in this case. Okay. Well, I love it when I don't leave quite enough yarn. Let's see, I do have more red coming up though. This red is a mix of a brighter red and a duller red. Which makes a difference, I think. The orange is just one color and it looks a lot flatter to me than the mix of the brighter and the duller red, the little bit more saturated red. This is wool. It's very grabby wool. I like to splice this because I will cut these off when it comes off the loom. Not every wool, not every fiber should be trimmed like that. I bet you can see like Less than 50% of what I'm doing, sorry about that. It's like when I'm making videos for courses and I'm trying to shoot with a camera right in front of me. That's how those, if you can see everything I'm doing, I'm probably weaving like this with a camera. Uh, between my legs, it's very awkward. 
Unless it's an overhead shot. All right, we're almost done with this red. Yeah, Michelle um, was at, talking about the browns in the basket. I was happy with that. I was not sure um, how dark I was going to go, so I basically just used three different colors, and I dropped the brightest color out of... I think I dropped it to one strand here and dropped it out completely from there, and it made a nice uh, progression. Okay. Um, I want a little hill here, but I'm running out of room. I also want the shed to be right. That is going to make a bump. Ah. And there's the, uh, when you have two warps, see how I caught that warp there. Let's see if I... Is it better when I do that? I think you can probably see it better. Here I caught um, a warp in the wrong place. As I was trying to take this out, it made it worse. I um, want a valley thread right on this warp, so I'm gonna move it over one so it fills in that little hole. Hills and valleys. And then I'm going to bring this all the way out so my shed is the same, so I can put the outline in. That's another valley. It's probably fine. Save that red for later. All right. I am reasonably sure I do not have a tail to do this last outline, so. This mix is a um, bright, two bright reds and one hot pink. This is silk from Weaver's Bazaar, it's 62 silk. And I'm using a really thin bundle for the outline because I'm doing a um, full sequence in the outline, so, um, and I don't know. If I were gonna do it again, I probably would have tried maybe a little bit of a um, thicker outline around these sections, but the whole piece has it, so. Obviously don't want to change it now. Oh, those of you who are shed pickers are probably appalled at my slow slowness with picking the shed. I do it a lot on pipe looms, but their warps are longer and it's easier. Also, these double warps are hard to pick up. Excuses, explanations, whatever. Okay, there's red. The next color I'm gonna check my cartoon is again yellow. So there'll be flames here and then this corner, I think, oh, you can't see it over there. It's gonna be blue. I say that with some trepidation because I put the very first part of the blue in and I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it. Let's finish this orange first so we can get the green going. Yellow, so now I'm back to Michelle's question like, oh, I put the yellow all the way up to here, so I think I will keep that consistent. noticing on the other parts I can see I didn't do that so oh well 
this is two strands of this super acid bright yellow and one strand of uh, yellow orange. The yellow orange sort of tones down that super bright gold a little bit. So same shed again, split weft outline. <sighs> Did finish all the letters. The lettering was fun. So hand basket with a period at the end. Almost done with the 16 EPI, except for there's a butterfly over here, which I added. Wasn't in the original design. Felt like we needed a little hope at the end of 2020. check the shed again. Um, Christine, I outlined with red first. So the idea of the split weft is that it, um, these are not, outlines are not done with split weft and you can see how wavy they are. That's the way tapestry works. Split weft divides the bundle in half and makes a smooth outline. To be honest, it's a little bit subtle in this area, partly because I used such a thin silk but I want the red, the color that I ended with, do, doing a split weft outline with the color I'm going to. So I did also outline with yellow, obviously. And oh, look, I'm in the right shed with this green. So this whole little corner gets filled in with these two colors of green. And looks like I need one more stitch on that. Well done, okay. I was checking where my, so I did one sequence there, but I've only done, I haven't met it with this one, so that's what I was checking. So now both of those sequences meet. Um, I missed the question about shoulder pain, you all. So um, shoulder exercise to avoid muscles. Paula asks, can you recommend shoulder exercises to avoid muscle strain from weaving on an upright loom aside from taking breaks? Um, there is a really great, her name is Missy Graf Balone. She runs a website called Wellness for Makers, and she has lots of videos, and she's got some great Instagram posts about keeping your body in great shape for making. And I, I really recommend, I've actually taken a few of her workshops. Um, she's great. She, I can't remember, her background is in yoga and some kind of fitness instruction. She's not a therapist, but she has really um, great ideas. So I will put a link on my website, but if you just look at Wellness for Makers, I think you can find... Um, I think you can find her and she should have some really good resources in terms of weaving on upright looms what I'm doing right now is if you can see in the little box below my arms are too high I'm having to use a lot of my um, the long head of my biceps and my the deltoids in the front and some of my pec muscles to keep my arms up like this and that's not great for my neck either. So the first thing I would say is move the weaving down. Keep it so that your arms can be um, in more of a neutral position, much lower. If you need glasses like I do now to see well, get the right glasses so that you don't have to hunch forward and look um, to see what you're doing. So um, 
my dad was an ophthalmologist and he is also a musician and he made himself music glasses, which is a common thing. If you go to the optometrist, they can do that for a particular distance. So you could go and get a pair of glasses that's exactly for your weaving distance. Um, just so you can keep your body in a better position. Um, you want your head to be up and your um, arms in a more neutral position. So beyond that, any upper body strengthening is great. And um, it may be more about strengthening even than stretching. I know we don't like to hear that, but um, we need to stay stronger as we get older. There is a great um, wall stretch that I really like, um, which might be helpful. It helps, uh, it helps me because I spend so much time on the computer. And if I don't have my loom positioned well, if you, let me switch the view for a minute. So if you take your arm like this, ooh, you're starting to see the middle age wobble there, um, against a wall and then turn your body so you're basically stretching this whole part of your arm. Um, and then you put the leg that is, you're standing up, you put the leg that is um, the same as the arm forward in a little bit of a lunge and just use your leg bending to judge how much stretch you're putting on your the front of your shoulder. That's a nice one, which I use fairly often. Now I have to be careful here not to make this green fill in this portion. Again, meeting these two sequences. Um, let's do this. went too far there. See that? How I went over. I didn't meet. Hold on. Nope, that is what I meant to do. No, I didn't. Just want to go to here. And then this one will close up this hole here. And go back. And then I will have completed that. And another splice. Oops, I lost my magnet there. Eva, that's awesome. Uh, shout out to, to Eva, who is in line to get her second vaccine shot. Awesome. Love it. Thank you for uh, tuning in while you wait. I love that. I think, Eva, are you in Spain? It seems like to me you might be in Spain, but I might be confusing you with another Eva. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit weird here. which you probably couldn't even see. <laughs> Next time around, my goal is in two weeks on the, okay, so the weird thing I did, let me interrupt myself. The weird thing I did is I actually put, I don't want this one to go under this warp, but I put it there to anchor it as I did the splice. And now I'm gonna pull it out and return it so that everything stays where I want it to go. 
It's not weird. It's just a little trick. Um, you can see my stitching is showing there. So that gets tightened up when I pull it off the loom, or I can tighten it up with a needle now, but you can even see my first stitch really well there. Um, yeah, now I've interrupted myself about, oh, my goal, <laughs> miracle of all miracles, I remember. Um, next time on Change the Shed in two weeks, which is June 23rd, I would like to, um, I'll be working on the butterfly. And then I hope it will be done. The butterfly is the last big piece of this piece. And then I can have this loom back and put something else on it. I actually have the, um, the accessory that they sell for this Aras loom is a, um, a beam accessory, so there's actually a, a top and a bottom beam for it, like you would have on a rigid head loom. And I'm, I've never tried it, and I'm super skeptical about it, but I have heard from other tapestry weavers that it works quite well. So I'm excited. I'm kind of excited to try it. I'll be bummed if I warp it and don't like it, but um, I have every confidence that it will be. Okay. Mostly because I have every confidence in Schacht. So I did, um, full disclosure, I did actually um, do some testing of this loom while they were working on it. And they did make, they actually made a lot of the changes I suggested, which was really nice of them which means I really like the loom <laughs> so that's the full disclosure is that I like the loom in part because they made the changes I wanted they were minor things that um, they just made better so the loom was great from the very beginning all right so this green is coming along great I wanted to get that in there to sort of hold this last outline in. This line is the top of, um, so there's a square in the middle that's 10 inches square and this is the top of that 10 inch square thing. And oh. uh, so, and then this is the top of the piece actually right at the top of where your screen is. So it's almost done. Um, Yeah, so the other thing, Paula, about the shoulder stuff is um, um, some people do a lot better on a horizontal loom. So you could actually consider trying a loom where the work goes horizontally. And depending on what loom you're using, you might actually be able to try that by putting an upright loom at an angle or flat to see if that will help. Some people really do much, much better. I prefer working on my floor loom, the Harrisville rug loom that's right there. Because the warp is horizontal, it's just more comfortable for me. But um, that's another thing to consider is whether you might want to try a different loom or try positioning your loom in a radically different way. If you, if you have a great big upright loom, you don't have a choice. But um, smaller looms, you might be able to reposition. Um, oh good, Ruth says she has the beams and they work. Okay, so this is going to be yellow and let's just fill this in. I like to, before I stop for the day, I like to leave myself at a spot where I'm, um, either that I can remember what I'm doing or that at least feels like I've sort of finished something. So I also like when I have things like this where I, I it just is calling out for me to start that yellow in that spot. So um, do, 
do 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 um thinking about shedding and how I want it to work and um that's the wrong way was considering whether I would start this with an eccentric pass or not which would make this easier. Is that correct? Oh, the silk is so slippery. I think this is correct now that I fudged it. Yeah. Those of you who watch carefully on Change the Shed will realize that there, or any other tapestry weaver, if you go watch them work, there is a mild amount of fudging involved sometimes. It's not cheating. Floats are fine. Unless you want a piece that is two-sided, which is occasionally the case. Um... Okay, I just I just feel a lot better getting that yellow started. I will sew that slit. Um, let's see if I zoom out a little and you can see the whole picture here. There. So here's the top of the center square. This butterfly will be like half and half, and here's the top of the piece. And um, it's been fun. It's been a fun piece to work on. Um, oh, good. Jessica says that um, Wellness for Makers does have a mini course about neck and shoulders. So that might be helpful. And Missy's really great, too. If you follow her on social media or whatever, um, she may be able to help you answer some questions or point you towards some resources that um, would be helpful. I always recommend... Carson Demers Knitting Comfortably book. It's He's a physical therapist and he has really an overall view of um, just crafting and keeping your body safe. So if, especially if you're also a knitter or a hand crafter, spinner, that is a great book. Um, it's called Knitting Comfortably. Um, no, Linda, that's a really interesting question. I'm going to answer that one. So Linda was seeing me, I think, make the bundle. So when I was making this um, bundle with the yellow, I went like this and broke it. And then I went end to end and broke it. So if you, what she's asking is, the, does that matter? Or should I keep the um, yarn going in the same direction. It doesn't matter, Linda. The twist will be the same whether you flip it around or not. So you can test that by um, playing with it some yourself, but it, it doesn't matter whether you, um, how you cut it. Um, you don't have to pull it off. It, you can reverse directions and it's fine. It doesn't make any difference. The twist is still in the same direction. Um, a tilting bench for floor loom can be helpful. So um, depends on the loom, but some people, that's really great for your pelvis. So that can really help your back, low back, upper back. Yeah, so definitely the bench you're sitting on. If you can't get a bench that has tilt in it, um, I'm, I guess this would be true of either a high warp or low warp tapestry loom with a bench. Um, you can get one of those wedge cushions, which helps keep your pelvis tilted forward a little bit, which can really help. Um, it can help all of your posture. Makes It makes a big difference. So yes, that's a great question, Naya. Um, yeah, and Jessica says she got a piano bench. So maybe try a cushion um, of some kind. I think those wedge cushions are, are pretty great. Cool, you all. I will be back on June 23rd, and fingers crossed, I'll be working on the butterfly, unless I end up finishing this piece before then. But if I do, I'll take some video of the butterfly so you can see. I'm, you can tell I'm really looking forward to the butterfly, right? This little thing up here. Um, 
So yes, thank you all for coming. Have a really great uh, week. It's almost summer um, here in the U.S. down in Australia. I saw someone posting yesterday that stay warm, everybody. So and I thought, oh, God, no, we're warm enough. Um, so those of you um, in the Southern Hemisphere, stay uh Stay, stay warm, but we don't want it any warmer here. We're having some warm weather in the States. All right, I will see all of you in a couple weeks. And in the meantime, have fun. Oh, I wanted to say that the Design Solutions course, season two, will open. It's open again now for registration. And the course content will open on July 5, so in a few weeks. So if you're interested in grabbing that class, it's been such a great... Um, such a great season so far. So if you want to get in on it, you can do that on my website. All right. I'll see you all next time. Couple weeks. Have a really great June. Bye y'all.